Welcome to Youth Talks, which is a new addition to our Initiate Talk interview series, where we'll be speaking with young professionals aspiring to be our future energy leaders. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Tinska Flora Benny, who is an energy policy consultant and also manager of the European Energy Transition East Meets West Network. Last year, as an investment advisor at Energy Investment Management and as part of her master's, Tinska researched the Polish and Hungarian, Hungarian energy transition and the implications of the European Green Deal. Welcome, Tinska. Thank you, Heather. Thanks for uh, having me here. Well, it's great to be speaking to, to you today. So um, let's kick off and, and let me ask you, why did you decide to focus your research on the energy transition in Hungary and, and Poland? And what would you say are the three top findings of your research? Lovely, thank you very much. Well, um, first of all, uh, for the reasons of choosing the topic, um, I myself come from Hungary, so it's my home country that I I wanted to explore the energy landscape of a little bit more. Um, originally, I wanted to focus on the Visegrad Four, which is um, uh, the group of uh, Hungary, Poland, Slovakia, and the Czech Republic, um, as I have been involved in sustainability work in the region. But uh, then I had to tighten the scope, and, and so came Hungary and Poland, which I think is also a very interesting country um, in terms of the energy transition. And I myself, I am now working but also very interested in energy policy and the uh, European Green Deal seemed uh, like a good hot topic to cover. Uh, then the corona crisis came which wasn't ideal for the research but that's a different story. Um, and about the findings, well let's just say that these things I think were already known before more or less but I would highlight three of them. So first of all um, the CE region uh, the Central Eastern European region, also including Hungary and Poland, has uh, a very high, maybe one of the, the highest uh, untapped renewable energy potential in the EU. Um, but they were essentially, they are essentially only doing their homework and in, in complying with the EU energy and climate policy. So not living up to their full potentials and not really bracing themselves for, for the energy transition that is coming. The second one is that sooner um, than we think, uh, market dynamics um, and simple economics will ultimately end fossil fuels dominance. Uh, many renewable energy sources are already cheaper and, and more profitable for investors. Um, so they are basically pushing these fossil fuels out of the, the merit order, which is great news. Um, also keeping in mind that uh, the structural changes that will have to be carried out system-wide, uh, also with the help of the European Green Deal and many new funds to dip into. And thirdly, um, it's interesting to, to observe how there's a significant uh, carbon leakage happening in the EU due to um, our emission trading system regulated carbon prices. So carbon leakage happens when uh, businesses move their production to other countries with the less stringent environmental regulations. So when there is an increase in emissions in one country as a result of a reduction in emissions by a second country with a strict climate policy. In this way, cheap uh, coal-fired uh, electricity imports are flooding EU countries, just like Hungary and Poland from non-EU territory like Serbia and Ukraine and so on, uh, showing that the EU is directly uh, supporting the cost of continued use of fossil fuels in these non-EU countries. Um, so these would be, I think, the, the most important findings of the research. And I also am very happy to see so much interest in my region uh, within professional circles. And, and this further reassures me that it's very much worth looking into um, the challenges and opportunities uh, at home and in the Central Eastern European region. Now, it's, it's obviously interesting you, you mention about the, um, the economics or the deteriorating economics of, of fossil fuels, but um, obviously a, a major stumbling block in Poland um, and the country achieving a successful energy transition is its kind of continued dependence um, on coal and cut, coupled with a very powerful, um, albeit heavily subsidised, coal mining sector. Um, you know, that employs a lot of people. Um, in practical terms, what does the, the Polish government need to do to, to address this issue um, and make sure that no one is, is left behind? Yeah, well, uh, first of all, let's just acknowledge the, the challenge that awaits because there are three dynamics uh, working here. So first of all, 
from an environmental perspective, we need to scale up uh, clean energy to, to avoid catastrophic climate change. From an economic perspective, luckily, as said before, uh, the prices of these clean energy sources um, are dropping year by year, so really making them more attractive than fossil fuels. And thirdly, there's a social dimension, which is very important because people who so far worked in these polluting industries like coal and coal mining uh, need new and, and well-paid jobs to provide for their families and, and keep their communities in place. And here we have Poland, which is a country uh, burning coal for most of its electricity generation mm -hmm. and, and primary energy use. Uh, with the society still very much reliant on the jobs and, and the livelihood uh, that this dependence, dependence brings to those employed. While in the Paris Agreement, it also as an integral part of European climate policy, countries adopted the principle that this energy transition uh, should be just, uh, guaranteeing good quality jobs for the coal industry workers and workers of other uh, traditional sectors that are affected by the transition. Uh, in the process of change. So there's a huge task ahead uh, and to manage these changes in the coal and the mining sector, the government I think needs to uh, first of all ensure uh, um, realistic expectations of all the involved parties. So acknowledge the inevitability of the decline of uh, hard coal mining and firing and, and most likely um, acknowledge that coal, coal mining will be non-existent by 2050. Um, so it will disappear. Uh, secondly, they need to clearly communicate uh, the prospects of this long-term decline uh, to the industry to ensure that there is uh, the time and, and resources available for, for the employees, the local communities, the miners' unions who, are, who play a very important role here and the companies, of course, to adjust to these changes. And thirdly, maybe most importantly, to work with these affected people. So these rounds of changes and closures should be managed uh, in, a, in a smooth way with as little damage to the local communities uh, as possible, while, while also taking uh, emerging opportunities for small towns and villages and regions into account uh, for them to survive and be able to build up another, um, a new sustainable future with, with new economic activities. And uh, luckily, other countries, for example, like Germany, um, have started the transition way earlier. So there are good examples to look at, I think. And uh, there's also a dedicated just transition mechanism and the just transition fund provided by the EU, which will have to be used smartly to, to get most of the benefits from this transition. It's clear that the just transition fund will not be used to save declining industries. Mm -hmm. Thus, the, the Polish government really has to decide on which side of, of history they want to be. So I would say that reskilling and upskilling of workers is very important here, uh, as well as coming up with uh, new uh, economic development plans and new areas of business um, that will take place of these uh, polluting activities. But I think with the right policy and, and market instruments and, and sufficient funds, this is all possible, although no doubt extremely difficult and expensive. But I'm also confident that the that European eyes will increasingly turn to Eastern Europe as uh, to the region where there is still a substantial amount of work to do, and uh, and we have to be ready simply not to uh, to begin too late with these with these uh, structural changes that have to be made and, and really not to leave those behind who who will suffer the hardships um, of this uh, environmental but also socio economic shift um, that we're seeing. Great. And if we um, shift our attention to Hungary, um, its cur current sort of renewable energy development strategy, um, certainly from the outside, does seem to be quite chaotic and, and maybe not particularly well thought through. Um, and as you pointed out in your re um, report, um, there's been analysis done where actually the renewable energy share of of Hungary's energy mix um, has actually sort of steadily decreased between 2013 and 2018. Um, what changes in, in Hungary's strategy would you like to see to, to kind of reinvigorate this sector? Mm -hmm. A very good question. Um, yes, so Hungary has uh, right now multiple strategies. We have the energy strategy for 2030, then the long-term clean development strategy until 2050, and of course the NECP, the National Energy and Climate Plan, um, that outlines the actions of the, of the next decade with regards to energy and climate uh, policies. I think these documents are mostly harmonized, so maybe it's worth to look at the NECP itself, because it has some controversial elements. So 
for example, one of the main priorities set out until 2030 is energy sovereignty, um, as the NACP says. However, the whole plan relies on new nuclear capacity, uh, 2.4 gigawatts, um, with Russian financing, Russian technology, and Russian fuel imports, which to a lot of us doesn't sound like sovereignty at all. Um, it also mentions the importance of energy security, but of course it wants centralized plants supplying based on electricity concentrated in one geographical point. Again, doesn't really help energy security. Uh, it only locks us into a state where we have limited options for renewables and, and, uh, and other more flexible sources. Also the NECP um, foresees a 15% increase in primary energy use, which, which cannot really be explained with, uh, with much. And it's also not in line with, uh, with the expectations of uh, a decarbonizing society. And also the 40% emission reductions uh, compared to 1990 uh, set out for 2030 are not very ambitious. So most of, this has, uh, most of this has already been achieved. And when we will close our single coal-fired power plant in the, in the near future, it will basically be achieved. So this, along with the only 21% share of renewables in the system by 2030 is, is very disappointing and just, again, doing the homework. So um, I think it would be nice to see, see more incentives in the strategy for decentralized energy and also for presumerism for households to be able to access cheaper and, and clean energy. Um, more of energy efficiency in, in housing and buildings. So we'd like to see the century old uh, building stocks being renovated and maybe not just a, a one-sided expansion on, of solar PVs as per the NACP um, at the expense of wind. Uh, because we could simply just lift the, the regulatory barriers for, for more wind energy, which is more environmentally friendly than most of the sources that we use and also local to simply embrace our, our full potentials for renewables. And of course, one of the most important points is to maybe reconsider the plans on nuclear because new nuclear is a central part of actually both Hungary's and Poland's national energy and climate plan. And of course, there's a much debated necessity of this um, also a very controversial topic. So from a system adequacy perspective, nuclear is okay. Many argue that with our current uh, infrastructure and without significant changes made to the grid, this is the most convenient solution. So it is argued that on the short term, it's necessary for the energy transition and for climate goals to be reached. But on the long term, it's, uh, it's very unsecure. It's ridiculously expensive. Um, we have huge waste issues with that. Of course, nuclear waste has to be um, tackled and, and stored for thousands of years and it just simply results in this inevitable lock-in into a very centralized mm -hmm. system of energy generation. Very inflexible production, sometimes prices going to negative, uh, there's no storage available, so there's a, a huge problem with system management when you use nuclear. And of course the financing is often shady, so I generally think that these plans would need further consideration. Um, but worth to mention that Hungary, Hungary at least, um, has a nuclear plant already, Fox. So Poland hasn't got it yet. They, Poland would basically just jump from one centralized system to, to another, uh, from coal to nuclear. So we really have to decide here how important energy security is and, and what we want to leave behind uh, through our children um, and how we do it, I would say, more renewables than, than flexible nuclear. But um, we will see. Thank you, Jinska. Um, so in your research, um, it, it very clearly came across um, that, that you're in favor of a greater cooperation between the energy community countries and, and the EU bloc. And I, I think you've given a flavor of that in, in the answers that, uh, that you've provided today. Um, and you also kind of talk about or raise the opportunity of actually creating a pan-European integrated energy system. Can you kind of elaborate uh, a bit more on that, uh, that idea? Yes, thank you. I think it's a highly interesting topic. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea of an interconnected European energy system is not something new. Um, we call it the, the Energy Union and it has been on the Commission's agenda for, for a while. But we could, I think, maybe see this as not just an internal EU market, but also extending to our neighbours. For this, I was um, inspired by one of my interviews done for my thesis with the director of the uh, Secretariat of the Energy Community. 
Um, the energy community basically um, is an organization that brings together the European Union and its neighbors to, to create an integrated pan-European energy market. Uh, and the key objective is, of, of them is basically to extend the EU internal energy market uh, rules and principles to, to countries in Southern Europe and the Black Sea region and beyond. So I think contracting parties right now are um, Albania, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Kosovo, North Macedonia, um, Georgia, Moldova, Montenegro, uh, Serbia and Ukraine. Um, so as said, the, the integration of these markets would be imperative for not only cross-border energy trade, but simply just um, integration with the EU market and, and its stringent uh, climate principles. So I generally think that the EU uh, would be capable of using its uh, sphere of influence and its economic power to advance the energy policy of neighboring countries and also let them be part of this huge challenge that we are all facing. Um, there's a need for stable regulatory and, and market frameworks uh, capable of attracting investments and in power generation and in networks in these countries too. Um, and we could help them before we leave them behind. Because for example, with the new carbon border adjustment mechanism that's gonna um, be introduced, uh, it will be harder and harder for these countries to export products and also, um, also cheap energy to the EU with, with all the taxes that are being put on, on their cheap prices. And uh, for example, one practical tool um, would be uh, to integrate these countries is, for example, to help them launch their own uh, emissions trading system. So mm -hmm. that with time, we can also integrate them into our own ETS and, and, and simply make sure that, that we don't leave them behind in, in this fight uh, against climate change, because we're after all in this together and it not only depends on the EU, but on other countries too. And um, as I mentioned in the uh, the introduction, um, you you also have a second hat. You're you're a ma you're the manager of the European Energy Transition um, East Meets West Network. So tell me um, more about the network and and what its main um, goals are. Yes, thank you. So. Um... The, the network, so Eats Meets West uh, in the European Energy Transition is, is basically a, a, a leadership program of, of energy investment management, the company that I worked for as an investment advisor in the past year, uh, where we have uh, 20 something um, young professionals working in the energy sector on board from both Western, Eastern and also Southern Europe. Um, we created this group because we, we see that the energy transition challenge is, is bigger in Eastern Europe than, than anywhere else in the Union. And uh, it's also a nice opportunity for Eastern European people and in, 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 in the region to learn from what went well in, in Western Europe and, and what didn't succeed, of course. Um, it's important to understand the local situation, for example, the, the, the importance of coal in Poland, local history of these countries, uh, it's just very good to learn from each other, I think, as we embark on the energy transition. So um, energy investment management is facilitating this network with my management, where we um, encourage knowledge transfer and, and discussions about different energy topics and, uh, and just try to collectively understand uh, the needs and, and the local situation of countries in the region. Um, we do this via various uh, online, well, online <laughs> because of the current situation right now, but online sessions. We had session, a session on renewable energy project finance. We had a session on energy transition regulatory frameworks uh, on the regional and the EU level too. Previously, we talked about my research. Uh, we talked about market instruments for renewable uh, deployment. And our next session in February is going to be on about energy trading. So really a very broad, um, um, topic range. Um, and we also see luckily that the Eastern European region is getting more and more attention from Brussels too. And we see that there's a lot of interest to learn, uh, learn about the, the region from young people too. So we involve our members in, in, in these sessions as well. People really enjoy it and, and, and make efforts to, to share their perspective and their experiences, um, uh, their professional experiences. So we really understand each other's context, uh, often not only just in the EU, but, but outside too, outside of the EU too. So generally, uh, I think that networking at the, um, the early uh, stage of people's careers can give uh, very nice insights and very nice career opportunities too. 
because um, yeah, when you come to the sector early, uh, then you win, um, which is good for young professionals. And I am also very happy to, to be able to share more of this Eastern European aspect uh, in our coming interview series with members of our network. And uh, I really hope that I can attract uh, more attention to, to the Eastern European region with this uh, initiative. No, it's, it sounds a fantastic um, addition to the kind of important energy transition dialogue. So we obviously wish uh, the network network huge success. Uh, Chinska, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you today. Um, thank you very much for, for discussing your research uh, findings and, and kind of presenting your, your interesting insights. Um, for anyone interested in reading Chinska's report, uh, you will find details below on how to download it. Thanks again, Chinska. Lovely. Thank you, Heather. Nice to be here.